Texas football falls against Iowa State for their fourth loss on the season. Men's basketball starts the season undefeated, and the Texas volleyball remains the number one team in the country. More coming up on College Press Box. Many have been waiting for this dynamic duo to debut. Welcome everyone to College Press Box. I'm your co-host Theodore Kim, and joining alongside with me is College Press Box All-Star, Clark Dalton. Clark, how's your weekend? Thank you for calling me an All-Star, by the way, and thank no you problem. for the handshake. No I had a pretty good weekend overall. It's just that time of year where college football and college basketball is really starting to heat up, and then it's in another exciting episode of College Press Box. So let's get right into it. After another nail-biting victory at home, the Longhorns packed their bags and headed to Ames, Iowa, hoping to keep their Big 12 hopes alive. Let's head to Jack Trice Stadium for the highlights. Back in black, Iowa State off to a fast start here. Brock Purdy pump fakes and finds Charlie Kohler in the back of the end zone. Second quarter, though, Purdy, Deshaun Jameson bounces off and intercepts him. Texas getting in their first turnover of the day in the second quarter. Big momentum changer. Relatively slow first half, but Sam Ellinger going to get the Longhorns up to pace here. Throws. Brennan Eagles stretches like Stretch Armstrong. That's a touchdown at the end of the second half. Big momentum shifter for Texas. Brock Purdy going to get a little magic here. Scrambling. Whoa! That's a long throw. That's at least 75 yards. And Deshante Jones is wide open. Chris Brown can't get the shoestring tackle. Iowa State goes up 17-7 to in the third quarter. Third and 10. Texas trying to come back. Ellinger. Keontae Ingram. Boom, shaka, laka. Texas is starting to roll down six at the beginning of the fourth quarter. Third and five. Ellinger, slant across the middle. Devin Duvernay doing Duvernay things as he gets into the red zone for Texas with a little over seven minutes left. 548 left in the fourth quarter. Fourth and goal. Ellinger scrambling around. Texas fans screaming at the TV. Throw the ball! And he finds Malcolm X right on the money to put Texas up one. However, there was still time left, and after a costly offsides penalty, Connor Asali knocks it straight through. Texas falls 23-21. to 21. We are here with Nick Kuholtz and Matt Marincheck. It's great to see you guys, fellas. I, I love you, and um, I just want to, you know, let you know that, uh, you know, well, what are your initial thoughts on this weekend's game against Iowa State? Because I'm very curious about that. Ted, it was obviously a really disappointing finish for Texas. You know, mm. rally back, you put two scoring drives together, finally get some momentum offensively. You're one first down away from coming out with the victory. Instead, Iowa State gets the stop. They give Purdy another chance, and he capitalizes on it. A senior captain making a mistake like Roach did, just a brutal way to end the game. Overall, with an exception of those two fourth quarter drives, though, by the Texas offense, the offense was pretty brutal. The play calling is still way too conservative. The amount of wide receiver screens is just asinine. Texas, they also had only 54 total rushing yards, 27. Exactly half of those came from Sam Ellinger. So when you're only getting 27 rushing yards from your running backs, you can never really expect to win a game when that happens. And again, the defense still has a plenty of areas to improve on. They have to tackle better and find any form of consistently, they got to get some pressure on the quarterback, too. Just a tough loss for Texas. Yeah, I think overall that the offense and defense both played poorly in this game. There's times in this game the defense looks very lost, especially you had the 75-yard touchdown pass to um, oh, yeah. Deshante Jones. Down there on the field, Purdy getting away from all the pass rushers, wide open Jones, 15 yards away from any defender, easiest touchdown of his life. And then you had a two-yard touchdown to Charlie Kohler, Four defenders on the goal line had no idea he was back there. Another easy touchdown that the defense should have stopped. And the defense very undisciplined on that game-winning drive. Three major turn um, penalties, the two pass interference calls, and that costly offside that would end up having Iowa State win the game. Well, yeah, couldn't agree more. Texas getting off to a bit of a slow start. It hurt their chances of possibly winning the game and extending their Big 12 hopes. With Texas out of the Big 12 race, what do you think Texas could have done differently? So I think throughout the course of the season, the offense has slowly started to get sluggish and more predictable. First five games of the season, you had 41 points a game, and then since then, only 25 and a half points a game, if you don't include the Kansas game. The offense was the strength of the team until the OU game. I don't know what could have happened after that game to cause the downturn in the production for this unit, but the offensive scheme is way too conservative. Ellinger doesn't ever have the opportunity to run, that, which made him so dangerous last year, and never takes deep shots down the field. Bubble screens are being called way too often. 
And you have all this talent in Ellinger, Juverde, Johnson, Ingram, Winton, just to name a few of these guys. And they're not being used to their full potential. And once they're used to their full potential, that's when Texas will be dangerous to get on offense and start winning games. All yeah, right. Matt touched on a lot of it there, really. The, the things we just talked about at Iowa State, it's the same thing that Texas has been struggling all season defensively. I know the injuries haven't helped, but at some point, that's not a full excuse. Got to get any form of pass rush you can. That's been non-existent all year long. Offensively, though, the, the thing that surprised me the most is the offensive line. I didn't realize until Saturday, Sam was the most sacked quarterback in the Big 12. Ooh. And at the start, going into the game, he's also the ninth most sacked quarterback in the entire country. The O-line has had trouble all season long. We've talked about enough horrendous mm -hmm. play calling and then just defensively, you know, with the talent that Texas has, you know, they have to figure out some form of consistently. But really, this all comes down to coaching. I think this coaching staff themselves are even conscious of the fact that they've had a really bad year. They know that themselves. Yep. They haven't made the right adjustment, adjustments, and it's hurt Texas throughout the season. Well, I couldn't agree uh, any more. And gentlemen, both answers, most excellent indeed. Now, what do you think the Longhorns are going to be in, with, in the future? With the Texas and the Alamo Bowl coming up, uh, do you think they could be potential destinations for them? Or what do you think they'll uh, be from here? Yeah, Ted, I, I think Texas finish this, finishes the season 1-1. One and one. They end with a 7-5 and five overall record. Whether they're in the Alamo Bowl, the Texas Bowl, the Camping World Bowl, it really doesn't matter. The point is, this season has been a disappointment. Disappointment for Texas, especially after the way they finished last year. I will say I think the expectations were a little bit far-fetched and high just because yeah. of the 10-win season, the win over Georgia. Mm -hmm. But it is still a disappointment. Nonetheless, the season obviously didn't go as anyone planned. So really, regardless of, of where Texas ends up, I think it's been you know a disappointing result, result so far. And I think most Texas fans would agree with that. Yeah, I honestly think Texas is probably going to go 1-1 one one the next two games. Baylor is a very tough opponent. Um, only have that one loss to OU, blowing the 20-3 lead. I feel like they're going to be pretty angry after that game, mm. take it out in Texas. But I think Texas will be able to pull it out versus Tech. I want to say they're going to end up in the Camping World Bowl or Texas Bowl. No way. Alamo Bowl, Sugar Bowl. They're not a top two team in the conference this year. And, um, yeah, I think the media hyped them up last year after that strong win, like Nick um, mentioned earlier. So I think the expectations were unreasonably high. We forgot there were eight starters on defense that graduated last year. It was a very young, inexperienced team, very unproven to the big stage. Well, Matt, I have to agree with you on the media hyping them up. Well, gentlemen, I really want to get some barbecue with you and talk more about football, but we have to go on. We will be right back with Zach Love, analyzing women's and men's basketball. Stay tuned for more. Welcome back to the most highly anticipated college sports show on the 40 acres. I'm glad you stuck around. I'm, I'm serious. Let's dive into Texas basketball. Last Friday, the Longhorns men's basketball team took on the Prairie View A&M Panthers in their second home game of the week. The Longhorns started off the game slow, putting up 26 points in the first half for the second consecutive game. However, a stout defensive performance and big minutes off the bench from redshirt junior Andrew Jones and freshman Donovan Williams propelled the Longhorns to a 14-point win. Every day we work on work on our game, and so you know when you go out there, I just try to have the confidence that you know is within me. And so if I feel it's a it's a good shot, you know I shoot it, and it's just whatever happens after that. After back-to-back -back wins at home, the Texas Longhorns will now go up to New York to compete in the 2K Empire Classic with the likes of Cal, Georgetown, and Duke. Head coach Shaka Smart says the team will need to make big improvements if they want to win it all. I think we need to play better uh, than we played the last two games. Uh, overall, uh, we did some good things, but I think overall, um, if we want to go up there and win, uh, but I, I think we're very, very capable. Uh, our guys have practiced well. Uh, they've done a nice job, you know, competing in practice. Despite the poor shooting performance, the Longhorns are still undefeated on the year with a record of 4-0. For Andrew Jones, he sees the potential this team has early on and feels that big things are on the horizon for the Longhorns. A, a lot of maturity, you know, upperclassmen, me, Matt, Jace, uh, Jericho, we try to emphasize that get past hard, do not show your frustration and just move on to the next play. You know, we try to have a short-term memory about things, and I feel like this is one of the hardest playing teams we have on defensive end that we had since I've been here. The 
team will travel to New York to play at Madison Square Garden next, a place they are all be familiar of after winning the NIT in the same building this past March. Zach Left, College Press Box. This weekend, the women's basketball team welcomed Arizona. However, they lost 83-58. to For more insight on the Longhorns' defeat, let's head over to the drum with Bailey Wald. Coming into the season, the Texas women's basketball team was ranked 15th nationally. But now heading into the third week, they're only one and two. While to fans it looks like the offense and a lack of shots is this team's weakness, head coach Karen Aston said there are problems with the defense, from fouls to a lack of aggression to missed rebounds. It's completely on me if we look like we don't know what we're doing and we look that like that a few times tonight. Again, it's puzzling to myself and our staff because we practice right now way better than we're playing. This team's two losses so far this season is not just the fault of the coaching staff but the lack of experience and flow among the players. As much as it looks like our offense is our problem, we're really struggling defensively. We're struggling with more than just that. When we put in a different lineup or someone subs in, there's a disconnection that happens very quickly that costs us possessions and maybe it's inexperience. Connection right now. We have some groups that work well with each other right now and this don't. So, I mean, we just have to get that under control. Although it is early in the season, Coach Aston is ready to make changes to push her team to be better. But she is aware that not everything that happens on her court can be controlled. There are some players that are in situations that they've never been in. We have two freshmen and LaShawn coming back from not playing at all last year. We have Suge that didn't practice all summer. With over a month left until conference play, the Longhorns hope to fix their flow and connection before taking the court against Big 12 team and taking a shot at the NCAA tournament. Bailey Wald, College Press Box. We have a treat for all college basketball fans as we have a double feature on both Longhorn teams. We're joined by our basketball aficionado, Zach Leff. Zach, great to see you. How you doing? I'm great. You're too kind for calling me an aficionado, but I'll take it. <laughs> hey, willing to hand out a compliment anytime. Let's jump right into it. Zach, Shaka squad is off to a great start. Will this momentum continue, and can we expect further victories down the road? Well, watch. It's a great start for the men's Longhorn basketball team. Shaka smart. They're 4-0. They had a nice win on Purdue on the, uh, on the road, so that's great. Um, I think that this can continue. Um, really, the main keys right now, defensively, Luke Yaklich, amazing hire by Shaka Smart and the Texas men's basketball team. He's the defensive coordinator of this team. He really makes this team run. Next thing you know, you have players, though, like Matt Coleman and Courtney Ramey. They're stepping up, making big-time plays. But then you have surprising players like Andrew Jones, Donovan Williams, Gerald Liddell. These guys are giving you big minutes off the bench and for Liddell starting. Um, when it comes to the team, though, uh, issues, inconsistency comes with a three-point shooting. And this was an issue last year. We had Clark for the Longhorns. They had a really big problem with not making threes. And for a team that loves to shoot a lot of three-pointers, they're only under 30% this year. That's really bad. So overall, great start for the Longhorns, but they'll have to clean up that three-point shooting. Yeah, and there's still time to clean it up, but the guard playing defense has been absolutely crucial and is really driving the team so far. Now on the flip side to the women's team, there were high expectations headed into this year, but they're one and two. What path do they take now? Yeah, so for the women's team who sort of ranked at 15, they took a loss in the opening game against uh, South Florida, and then you have a loss this week, uh, this weekend or Sunday against Arizona, and you let up 44 points to one player, Ari McDonald, in the first half. It was 22 to 19, Ari McDonald over the Texas Longhorns. That starts with that defense. That defense has been inconsistent. Granted, they have players injured and the chemistry is not there. And with defense, that's such a big thing to have chemistry to know that your teammate has your back. However, they are not just defensive issues. They also have offensive issues. The three-point shooting, the turnovers, the foul shooting has been horrendous for the Longhorns. So for Karen Aston and her lady Longhorns, it's really important for them to have big performances from LaShawn Higgs and Shook Sutton, two people who are supposed to score for this team and provide veteran leadership. So the Longhorns have definitely not lived up to expectations so far. Yeah, Zach, you touched on a very important point there. Is there were so many injuries last season, and when you reinsert these injured pieces, it's just hard to develop that chemistry again. Definitely. Now, I know it's early, but it's never too early to talk some March Madness. Will both of these teams be in the tournament well, you said it right, never too early to talk about March Madness, and I do think both teams will make the tournament. Now I'm going to start, though, with the men's basketball team. The men's basketball team, I said in the preview, 
was going to be an 11 team, maybe a last four out. However, I do think they boosted their resume a little with this 4-0 start and a professor's win against Purdue. Now, the men's basketball team will have a chance, you know, against Georgetown and Duke this week, potentially Duke, let's say, if they get through Georgetown, to prove that they're a tournament caliber team. Bigger than just an at-large, but a team that will compete. However, the men's always big issue is the Big 12 play. So for the Longhorns men's team, I think they are a tournament team, but we have to wait a lot to see if they're a bona fide tournament team, a potential contender. However, with the women's team, I think it's, you know, I wouldn't say you get off the bandwagon yet. Yes, it's a one and two start. They are now unranked. However, in the, in the non-conference, you have plenty of time to make your case. NC State, Tennessee, Stanford. You have all those teams to win, all those chances, and ultimately, I think they will make the tournament this year, as we expect. Karen Aston will just need to ship the, turn the ship around, make sure the horns are on track, because if they get wins in these games, they should have a relatively easy time in the Big 12. Not necessarily a bona fide locked number two contender for the Big 12 after Baylor, but they should have a relatively good time and enough to make wins in order to make the tournament this year. Couldn't agree more. And there's still time for this Karen Aston team to regather. And this matchup for Shaka Smart's team in the 2K Empire Classic will be a telltale sign of their ceiling. Of course. Thank you so much, Zach. Great stuff as always. When we come back, the number one volleyball team in the country steamrolls over TCU in straight sets for win number 14. Stick around. You won't want to miss it. So yeah, it's great to be back and let's get to the nitty gritty. Let's get to the volleyball. Oh, beautiful night at uh, Greg Gym. First set, Michaela White puts Texas up with the big kill. Oh man, what a crazy kill. Afterwards, Molly Phillips plus Michaela White equals double block. Oh man, second set. TCU gets an early start with this kill right here, but Texas comes back with Gabriel finding White, leading Texas to a second victory. Whew. Oh man, oh man. Third set. It's a little close here, but Eagleson dives for, Eggleson, sorry, dives for the loose ball and misses White, gets over the top, getting a clutch kill. And Texas wins, getting that 14th win. We now welcome our top-notch volleyball analyst, Jaxie Pigeon. Jaxie, how are you doing this Monday evening? I'm doing great, Clark. Thanks for having me. Great to hear. So during this 14-game win streak, it doesn't seem to matter who Texas faces as they always find a way to victory. What are the reasons for their dominance? You know, Clark, I do think it is the young players on this team that keep them winning. You talk about the players that stand out, and all of them are either freshmen or sophomores, minus Micaiah White, who's a senior. This team is also very well-rounded. When you try to pick out one thing that makes this team so good, it's not possible because the stats show great offense and defense. Micaiah White specifically stood out in Saturday's matchup, dominating offensively and defensively, recording 14 kills, three blocks, two aces, and two digs. Those are some notable numbers for sure. Then you have freshman Skylar Fields, who stepped up and posted nine kills and three blocks, making it seem as though she is a veteran player. And also, this team has been playing really great without Breon Butler, which is very impressive considering how integral she is to the team. But she was able to make her presence known at TCU. when She, she made her presence known when she stepped foot on the court, having a season-high eight blocks. Coming off an injury, I think that's very impressive. So since this team is so well-rounded, has young players, and has Breon Butler on their side, that is what keeps them winning. Yeah, and Breon Butler today was named Big 12 Defensive Player of the Week, so she's just imperative to the success of this team, but if they can keep winning without her, they're in good shape. Definitely. Very well deserved. Even though the Longhorns have been excellent, the schedule gets a little bit tougher this week with the highly anticipated rematch against Baylor. So, does the streak continue or snap at the hands of the Bears? Well, coming off their sweep over TCU on Saturday, Texas is now 19-2 on the season and undefeated in Big 12 play. The most memorable moment for this team was definitely that first sweep against Baylor, considering it was probably the most highly anticipated matchup of the season. They will take on Baylor again this Wednesday, which could potentially be a competitive matchup. However, they made it look way too easy when they took them on in their first matchup earlier in the season. 
Baylor's very own Yosiana Presley will most definitely force Texas to play their A game. However, Coach Elliott and his staff have been working very hard all season to find her weaknesses, and they definitely showed that in that first matchup. Baylor has the upper hand in the fact that it will be at their home, um, in front of their home crowd. However, the way Texas is, has been playing, I think it would be very impressive if they did not win. Yeah, in their last matchup, Texas won that second set against Baylor 25-10. to 10. That is ridiculous. Again, like I said, way too easy. <laughs> exactly. And now for the, moment of, for the moment of truth, does this team finish at number one? So this team has three games left in um, conference play. The strength of this team, especially the young players, is unmatched in terms of competition. Of the three games that they have remaining, they've already played against all these teams and swept all of them except for their 3-1 to win over Iowa State earlier in the season and the 3-1 to win over Oklahoma a few weeks ago. This team plays their A game when they're up against top competitors, but I feel like sometimes they play down to their competition as well if it's not a highly competitive matchup. Um, I think the reason that they did not sweep these teams was, again, because of their tendency to stoop down to the level of play of the other teams and not maximizing the abilities that they know they have. Also, you can't be perfect, so it is acceptable to not sweep every team. I think we're taking it for granted that Texas can sweep this many teams in a season. And also, I believe that this team has the greatest shot at remaining number one in the Big 12, as well as in national rankings, again, as long as they stay healthy and continue to play like they did against Baylor in that first matchup, which I think that night looked like the top, country, top team in the country. Yeah, and if Texas can continue this consistent play, there's a bright future ahead. Jaxie, awesome job. When, when we come back, it's a tale of two coaches. Hear the latest from Shaka Smart and Tom Herman. Welcome back to College Press Box. Despite the Longhorns having early momentum, Shaka Smart thinks his team can elevate to a new level. He discussed this at his Monday press conference. Not just as simple as us saying, well, we have, we've got pretty good guards, you know, that we have to go outplay, you know, the other teams. And that's not just scoring the basketball, that's managing the game, that's, you know, valuing possessions, which is something that we have to get better at as a team overall. That's the defensive end, spearheading our defense. And, you know, I think so far our, our guards have done a, a, a pretty good job of some of those things. And in some of the other areas, we need to get significantly better if we want to win this week. This afternoon, Tom Herman talked about the current situation of Texas football. Herman emphasized how strong offensive plays can lead to greater success. We have shown throughout the season, especially against good defenses, that we, we can be a good offense. Uh, and we, we've got to get back uh, to that. So I, I, I do think we have some strengths, uh, and we're, especially defensively, we're, we're continuing to, to build ourselves back up. The final orange versus white scrimmage game is coming tomorrow at Dish Falk Field at 4.30 p.m. The orange team has caught up and tied with white for the fall World Series. This game will, deter will determine it all. Be there tomorrow. Cross country excelled at the Big 12 championships. The Longhorn women finished second, while the men finished third. This was the highest finish for the women since 2011 and the fifth consecutive top three finish for the men. This week, 11 current and former Longhorn tennis players will participate in the Drop Shot LLC Men's Pro Tennis Open. This inaugural tournament will have professional athletes from all around the world battling it out for ranking points and prize money. This week in Longhorn Sports starts on Wednesday as women's basketball hosts UT Rio Grande Valley at 11 a.m. on Longhorn Network. This is also the school game. It's a fun one. Check it out. Volleyball heads to Baylor at 7 p.m. on ESPN+. Thursday. Men's basketball heads to the Big Apple for the 2K Empire Classic on ESPN2. Friday, it's another TSTV game day as we host Club Hockey versus Texas State. 8.30 p.m., you can catch it live on YouTube. Saturday, November 23rd, football goes to Baylor at 2.30 p.m. on FS1. Volleyball will stay here hosting Kansas at 7 p.m. on the Longhorn Network. And then the week caps off with women's basketball hosting Southern at 1 p.m. on Longhorn Network. 
Clark, once again, thank you for sharing your, me your wisdom and knowledge on sports. And man, for those who don't know, it's Clark's birthday. He is 20 years old, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Happy birthday, Clark. I oh, got thanks, Dad. I really appreciate it. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Happy was that birthday, a man. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> You can tune in to our sister shows, Crossfire, on Wednesday nights and Want to Know Sports on Friday mornings with Thomas Fitch and Robert Trevino. Whether you're watching this on your TV, laptop, smartphone, smart car, or wherever you're watching it on, Clark and I would like to thank you all for watching. Well, have a great night, and from all of us here at the studio, you, you have, have been, been watching, watching College, College Press, Press Box. Box. Happy birthday, man. Thanks, Dad. I really appreciate it.